Hi, this is Lang Martin Jr., author of Permission to Fly, and you are listening to So Booking Cool with Jewel B. Hey, Jewel B here. So here is part two of my conversation with songwriter and author Lang Martin Jr. Stay tuned on So Booking Cool. And Rub It In, which has, which has you know, a sweet, humorous story behind it because that happens so organically, right? Can, can you tell <laughs> You're us? You're right. Right? Yeah, yeah well, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, Rub It In occurred in our backyard in Connecticut on a day when we were cooking hamburgers and people were lying in the sun and people saying, you know, rub that rub suntan lotion on my back. Somebody just said to the other, you know, hey, rub it in. Would you rub it in? And I had my guitar there and I just said, rub it in, rub it in. And my wife head just kind of popped up. She said, hey, is that already a hit? And I said, no, I don't think so. And she said, well, that sounds like a hit to me. And so I, I finished the song pretty much that day. And um, I mean, I've often wondered what would happen if my wife had been in the bathroom at that moment and not, <laughs> not said, hey, that sounds like a hit to me. But uh, I had made contact with a genius music guy in Nashville named Ray Stevens. And I was sending him songs furiously every twice a week probably but I sent him rub it in the next morning and he called me at my little fast food restaurant and said Lang this is a complete smash if you'll come down and we'll record this song we'll put it out with you singing it so I went down a week or so later we recorded it but it, it was to the end of the summer Jewel and so it became a big hit in Houston and a couple of other good sized markets but it by the time it was it had proven itself and was ready to spread elsewhere. It was not summer anymore, so no one wanted to play a, a song about going to the beach when it was fall and chilly. So I used that version of me singing it as a demo, and a couple of years later I pitched it to a guy who was having big hits at the time named Billy Crash Craddock. He was a, a country elvis type singer, and he made a wonderful record of it became a big hit and then about I don't know maybe 15 years later or so uh, it became a really long-running successful commercial for Glade plugins and they changed the words to plug it in plug it in instead of rub ah. it in, rub it in. and it, it ran forever right at a time when our kids were you know in college and stuff so I really really appreciated that extra blast of cash to pay for <laughs> pay for the expenses Wow. So, you know, yeah, yeah. And it's funny, God, you just never know where where things happen or what, what's going to happen with them. You just kind of know if you don't get it out there or at mm -hmm. least try to get it out there that nothing can happen. But I, I really, you know, I did pitch my songs and I loved it. And I got most all of the records that I ever got with one or two exceptions. I got personally and I got a huge thrill out of, you know, making appointments to play songs for record producers and going in and seeing if they liked them and playing it for them. And sometimes they turn the song off after, you know, 20 seconds and say something like, no, that's the wrong tempo. We've already got four songs that are roughly in that tempo and we need a song in X tempo or something. Or they might, if I play them a song, let's say about, about a family, let's just say it. And they might say, you know, she just had a miscarriage. She's not going to be singing songs about kids right now. You know, this was info I wouldn't have gotten if I was not personally taking my songs to people. But being in the room and when they had their response, I, I could learn and tune up my next pitches. I said, okay, well, this guy likes this. This guy likes this. This woman's going through this. Maybe this song would fit, you know. But this is all stuff that had someone else been representing me, I never would have known. So being there in the room, also, aside from the information gleaned, when someone wigs out for a song and says, God, that's fantastic. I mean, there's rarely a feeling like that. You go, holy cow, this guy's, you know, recording a, a superstar and, and he loves my song and that's just busy. So I would go to lunch and think, oh God, maybe this guy's going to record my song. And then even if they didn't end up recording it, I got so much juice out of the initial excitement that it propels you onto the next thing. And 
you know, you kind of learn to, you know, let in just enough hope to keep you going, but not enough that when it doesn't work out, you, you're crushed. There was a, there was a saying before CDs came out and the saying was, when when everything was on vinyl records, so it it ain't final till it's vinyl, meaning that don't count your chickens until you actually hear the record. So, you know, there's all kind of you know techniques you we all use to survive and you know keep from being decimated by all the beatings we take trying to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. When you submitted "Rub It In" after like getting the great idea for it and and your wife, Linda, suggesting it. So when you put the song together, were you worried about the lyrics being protected and, and, and like, keeping the credit when you submitted it to Ray Lee? You know, uh, that's, that's, such a, that's such a good question, and I really do think that creative people can't help being concerned with that. i got to say, I never was, and I, I don't really know why. I think, I think in general... Most everyone you ever deal with is honest, um, or at least I felt they were. Um, if if anyone got a reputation for for you know stealing song ideas, they they would be, in certainly in Nashville, they would be quickly um, cast to the side because it's such a small community that no mm. one would bring any good songs anymore. Um, I think. You know, I've, I I never played my songs out, so to speak. There's a wonderful listening room in Nashville called the Bluebird Cafe, where songwriters play songs, both new songs and old songs, in the round. And there's a, the audience. I think that place might hold a hundred people or something. So it's an intimate place. But people would often, you know, test out their new songs there. And I did often wonder if playing a song in in a setting like that were you know, you really don't know who's listening to it would, um, you know, give someone an idea and then they would write that song. But I honestly don't think I've ever heard of that ever happening. As crazy as that sounds, I, I, I don't think, I don't know that I've ever heard of anyone who felt like their song got, got taken that way. I, I know that there have been situations where people have sued because a song that's been a hit is uh, considered to be similar to another song that comes out later that's a hit and there have been certainly lately in the last few years some high profile lawsuits over that but the thing that you're describing where you play a song for someone and then they take it and, and i i've never heard of that or anyone ever having that happen and then and you're you bring up an interesting point because it is kind of crazy that that's never happened but and it may have happened but i've never heard of it happening mm-hmm. yeah well that that's great i'm glad that that didn't happen um, sh- is there like a process or a procedure that songwriters need to do, though, like maybe involving publishing rights? Well, uh, what's interesting about that, Jewel, that's another interesting question. Most of the time, when this, and I'm just saying most of the time, um, mm-hmm. if a songwriter brings a new song into a publishing company, the publishing company, just for people who don't know, are the people who are responsible for the business end of a song. And the, the writer is considered the, the writer and or the creator of the song. That in general, the, the publisher gets half of the money from the song and the writer gets half of the money. I, I'm just giving you in, in general. That's the way it breaks down. Um, so when you bring a song into the publishing company, if you're a writer, what most of the time they've decided is the smart thing to do is they don't copyright the song until it's out. And the reason they don't do that is a song's copyright runs out in 56 years. And so if you were to copyright a song today and it's not recorded for 10 years, then the the meter is still running on your copyright. So when it's recorded, you only have 46 years to go. So people generally wait and and want to capitalize on the most the longest period of time of, of the of the copyright, if that makes any sense to you. Um, yeah. Not everybody does that. There are people who copyright the songs immediately. Um, there is something you can do, and that is you could you could register the song title with either ASCAP or BMI, um, or you could you could some people mail it to themselves, which is the old-fashioned way to show the postmark. 
uh, you could um, have the, the date of the demo. Um, today, when a lot of people make them on their computer, it would probably register, you know, the, the time stamp, so to speak, on the on the computer or in the studio, they might have a record of the day that you made the song, you know, made the demo. There would be ways, but oddly enough, it's just, it's rarely, I, I can't think of a time it's been a problem. And if it is, I mean, there are times when people will, you know, songwriters who write a lot of songs, you know, might write a song title and then 10 years later, forget they've written that title and be in the room with with a co-writer or something and write that same title again completely unaware that, that they've already written that title in, in the cases like that that i've heard the 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 writer if they ever realize it will call the the first guy and say hey listen i made a mistake and you know i wrote the same title you know like in one case i remember doing that and say i'm i'm giving you the the you know whatever share that i had of this other song because i accidentally wrote this you know and you know there's a way to work it out is my point but most most people want only credit for something they've done and they would no more if if it's ever done in any it's an accident and they would gladly change it if they have a clue that they've stepped on anybody else's song so as you as you mentioned throughout this interview too you've always had like taste for different kinds of music various genres did you ever feel like you had to stick with one when you were first starting out or was that not was that not something that you had to run into That's another great question. No, I never felt I had to stick with anything. I loved all kinds of music and I wrote whatever I thought I could do. If I, you know, if I got an idea and it seemed to be a, however it came out. And also, Jewel, it's it's interesting you, you, the way you make the demo often dictates the genre of the song. So you could have a song that could be done in, you know, let's so, say sort of a, what I call an R&B type way, like a, in my case, the Pointer Sisters or something. But you might also be able, like I had a song recorded by the Pointer Sisters that was also recorded by Tanya Tucker, who is a country singer. Um, she made sort of a, a, sort of a bluesy version of it. But she wasn't a, you know, a, a rhythm and blues or, you know, uh, urban artist at all. She was, you know, very purely country. But, um, you know, I would think about the style I was making the demo in and, you know, who, who do I think this song suits and, and then try to make a demo that might communicate that to them so when they, listen to it they don't have to do all the brain work and say well that's done kind of in a rock and roll way but we could do it in kind of a bluegrass way i i they might think of that but that's often mm. it's often better to just make it as simple and spoon feed it as much as you can so that the listener who's listening to say 60 songs that day doesn't have to sort out my song and say you know readjust the genre that i've interpreted it into their genre if if you know what I mean did you foresee yourself working with Elvis who was your idol oh god no you know I, I just had no clue I sent him so many songs though there was an address that pretty much everyone had and I sent him I really don't know how many songs but let's just say 20 songs I never heard word one and the only reason I ever got a song recorded by Elvis is that a very famous publisher in Nashville uh, who I knew because I was always out pitching my songs and he was always out pitching songs written by the writers that he represented and, and we just became really good friends. I was crazy about this guy. He was probably probably about 20 years older than me or so and had been doing it, pitching songs forever and he was probably the most respected and or, or arguably at least one of the one or two most successful music publishers in Nashville. And one, everyone knew that he had a direct line to Elvis. He had been the publisher of Burn in Love and other things that Elvis had recorded. And one day he just sat down next to me and he said, Lang, you work your ass off. Do you have a song for Elvis? Because if you do, I'll get it to Felton Jarvis, who was Elvis's producer. And I said, God, yeah, you know, I do. And he said, well, bring it to my office today at whatever, three o'clock. And at that time, um, tapes and 
were, were the most common way of taking songs to people. But Elvis was still back in the era of discs, as I described in the very beginning, was the way when I first began writing songs, every demo was a disc. So I had to find a guy who would make a disc from my tape. So I took the song way down to this guy, and he cut a disc of it. And I took it to uh, this guy's office, and uh, I'd say about a week later, Elvis's producer, again, Felton Jarvis was his name, called my publisher, Ray Stevens, and said, Ray, I think Elvis is going to go crazy for this Way Down song that Ed Lang sent me. And so Ray came into my little cubicle, which is like literally a four by four foot X room closet <laughs> that I loved, had great echo in it. Um, and he said, you know, Felton just called and, and he thinks Elvis is going to wig out for your song. And I thought, oh, this is the greatest thing going. So I jumped in my tragic little Volkswagen that was about 10 colors and had no headliner and was a mess. Raced home, told my wife what had happened, that he thought Elvis would like my song. But honestly, then three or four months passed, Jewel, before I heard anything. And then I heard again on the street that Elvis was again looking for songs. So I got another disc cut, took it back to this guy's office. And I'd say... 20 minutes later, I got a phone call or 10 minutes later that said from his secretary, and she said, Lang, I think Elvis has already recorded this song. And I said, well, that's impossible because I would know. And she said, no, let me check. And like a minute later, she called back and said, yeah, Elvis recorded that song, you know, October 30th or whatever in the jungle room at Graceland. And I thought, well, this is the most amazing, incredible thing that could ever possibly happen in my whole life. And then a week later, Felton Jarvis called Ray Stevens' office from me and said, Link, do you want to come over? I'm mixing your record. And so mixing is the part where in the recording studio, they take all the different tracks, you know, the track with the drums, the track with the guitar, the track with the bass and everything, mix them together and add echo or reverberation or whatever gonna, they think going to enhance the record. They mix it all together and it turns into the final version of the song and anyway so i went over to this studio and i walked in the door and i i heard this throbbing bass and drums and i thought god that's the introduction to my song you know and then suddenly i heard this is all in the lobby of the recording studio i, heard, I started heard elvis singing i thought this is just beyond description i opened the door to the studio and the engineer and the producer Felton Jarvis were in there they they turned off the tape and it was dark and they turned on the light for a second and they introduced themselves I'd never met either one of them and they said sit down you know we're mixing your record it's fabulous and so I sat down they turned off the light and I'm sitting there on a couch in the dark listening to Elvis Presley sing my song and thinking about being in the back seat of my mom's car you know when I'm seventh grade girlfriend and wigging out for him singing and I think what are the odds that this could possibly happen, you know? And I, I've never been able to answer it, but it's just a luck factor and people doing good things for each other and all the things that i found really do make the world work and what we all hope is the treatment that we get and what we all hope uh, the way we can spread that good treatment to other people if given the opportunity. What were some of the most memorable emotions and experiences that you had when sharing your life story and permission to fly? Well, all the things that I, I put in there, you know, like the, during the time in the, I, I think I was 13 when um, the rural, very rural Connecticut neighborhood where we lived, uh, which was an hour from New York City, began to get kind of fancy because wealthy people began buying summer houses and weekend houses all around us. And uh, this very simple neighborhood suddenly was kind of rich, you know. And I started knocking on doors and, you know, asking people if I could mow their lawn, wash their cars, clean their swimming pool, whatever. And one of the doors that I knocked on was the door of Benny Goodman, the famous clarinetist. And, you know, what I learned, it's impossible to put a value on, on what I learned from him, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of simple examples. 
first day that I went to work there that he was home, I was kneeling in a bed of roses, weeding, and over the top of the apple trees came the sound of somebody playing the clarinet. They were just playing musical scales, just like da 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 over and over and over and over. And every single day I went to work there that he was home. That's what I heard. And so I filed away the fact that uh, the most famous clarinetist in the world practiced every single day. A gigantic lesson just in that one thing. And then there was a time one summer when he was throwing a huge pool party and people, famous people flying in from all over the country for this event and been preparing for it for a couple of weeks and the day came and I had the gardens weeded and the lawn mowed and the pool deck swept and so on. The very last thing to do was to clean the swimming pool and when I finished vacuuming the pool, uh, it glowed and shimmered like, you know, worthy of the Beverly Hills Hotel until I went back to turn off the vacuum system, accidentally reversed it, fired back into the pool all the dirt I had just fired out of the pool, vacuumed out of the pool. And the pool was black, uh, you know, polluted. And I had to go in and, and tell him that I had wrecked the pool for his pool party. <laughs> And uh, I was terrified, naturally. But, you know, he came downstairs, and I walked him out to the pool, and he looked at it, and after a few, oh, Christ almighty, what are we going to do? Lang, you got to get this clean, you know, and few of that, and he finally settled down, and after a few minutes, you know, he just looked at me, and he said, you know what? You know, I think people are going to laugh there asses off when they see this and i said oh my god i hope so and he said they will i promise you it's going to be a great party and then he put his hand on my shoulder and he said hey i got to get upstairs and comb my hair and linda and i have tried to be one half that wise with our children because messages like that are indelible to a kid they were for me and i hope they were for some of our boys wow mr ling I also, I have just a few more questions left. What are your thoughts on the current state of the music industry? Well, I'm not involved in it anymore, really. I spent the last 10 years writing my book. So I honestly, I don't know. I don't know the songs. I don't, I'm not taking my songs around as I did for so long. So I'm really not in a position to comment on it. Um, I, I'm just in a different world now. I, I think about, um, what we're doing right now, you know, talking about my book and encouraging people to read it and, you know, sometimes reading letters and emails that I get and some of the reviews. I, the book now has 63 five-star reviews on Amazon. And I read, these, Ooh, yeah. you know, reviews from people that I've never met. And I read them and I said, that is the most invigorating, you know, uh, satisfying thing, gratifying thing. I could possibly read this. People feel like, you know, it's helped them be better parents or help them, you know, you know, in their relationships with something. And, and these are things that just come kind of out of the blue because everything I wrote in my book is, is just my experience and, and, you know, basically how people treated me or things that people did for me or lessons that I learned from people and the idea that they could translate in any way to things that have, uh, you know, helped or reached other people is just, it's just honestly, it's the most thrilling thing I could possibly imagine. And it's related to the feeling that I got when that first New York Times story, you know, generated all this, this emotion, that emotion I think is just, you know, is the key to life, you know, hopefully translated into emotions of affection for people and, and you know, decency and stuff. And that's what I feel when I read these letters mm -hmm. or these emails. Um, just, you know, a unifying of all of us because we just all need each other so badly. We need to be treated well by each other. That's the whole thing we need to do for each other because more than anything in the world, we, we want to be respected. That's just the first thing, more than food almost. If someone respects us and treats us well, I mean, 
I mean, God, I can go for a long time just on that feeling. I don't really need a hamburger as much as I need that. And mm. so the idea that maybe this book is is reaching people in that way is just it's just priceless to me. I mean, if, if I meet someone and, and they sound in any way interested in my book, if I have one in my car, I give it to them. I don't, I don't want any money for it. I've, I'm giving a lot of the money to the literacy groups in both Nashville, where we live, and in this little village in uh, in Rhode Island where we spend the summer, uh, they have a, a literacy volunteers group too. And, and I I can't think of anything more meaningful in in the world than to be able to read, or m- any more of a detriment to not be able to read. You know, one day on the radio a few weeks ago, I heard this man who was 55 years old. He was sounding out the word wonderful, and I thought. God almighty, imagine him trying to read an agreement or a contract, let alone a book or a letter. I mean, you're so inhibited by or or hindered by not being able to read. So um, I've been giving, you know, book talks and stuff and any of the, all the many earnings that the the books have earned from people buying books have all gone to these literacy things because, you know, that I feel is, you know, that, that just changes somebody's life if they can read i mean I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know jewel but but god when i when i mm-hmm. think of people coming from another country and people thinking they're stupid because they can't read or because they can't speak well when actually they're smart as hell they just are only learning english um i can't think of anything more ven- beneficial than you know pitching in to help them learn to read wow and on that note mr lang martin junior everyone Ooh, it was amazing talking to you, sir. Like, thank you for it. Well, you're, you're a treasure. You ask such fantastically meaningful questions, and I can't possibly thank you enough. Oh, that is so kind. I really appreciate that, that compliment. Um, and it was, it was such a pleasure. You're an amazing guest to have. Like, what a, I'm so happy that we've been able to have this moment and have this interview. How can people oh, well, get, yeah, yeah, go on. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I, I would love to have a copy of, of this interview. If you could ever make one and email it to me, that would be fabulous. You know, Bev, oh, absolutely. Bev will, well, Bev will give you uh, any, you know, contact info that you need, and I would just love to have it. And Actually, I'd love to stay in touch with you because you're obviously a pretty remarkable, you're kind of a brainy, remarkable person, so I don't want to lose <laughs> touch with you. <laughs> oh, my. Wow. I'm I'm so glad that you said that because I was like, Wow, this cannot be the end. We have to stay in touch. Would love to talk to you again, like like just in general. So yeah, we will definitely stay in touch. How can people get permission to fly? Well, the best, the simplest way is to just get it on Amazon, and it's it's in hardback, it's in paperback, it's on Kindle, it's in an audio book, and I recorded the audio book, and um, I've got to say, you know. I've gotten this feedback on people listening to the audio book and they just say, God, I've never listened to an audio book before, but this is fabulous. I love it. So you, if you haven't tried an audio book, you might go on audible.com or on Amazon. You can buy the audio book on Amazon also and, you know, have it downloaded to your phone or your laptop or, or whatever and listen to it that way. So that's, that's a, a fourth choice in addition to the paperback, hardback and Kindle. But it's on Amazon yeah. and you can have it. You know, have it tomorrow or on. you can have the audio book in 10 minutes, you know. Yes, definitely make sure you guys check out Permission to Fly. You you, you have to. We all have to. And are you on social media or you have a website at all, Mr. Lang? I, I do have a website. And if you, if you like the book and want to write to me, just write to me on the website. I would love to read anything you have to say. And, um, you know, if you. If you feel if you do read it and feel like writing a review on Amazon, I would really appreciate it because apparently Amazon reads these reviews and it really helps to have good ones. And uh, you know, as I said, I've been thrilled to have a bunch of them. But boy, I'd love to have yours or or anybody else <laughs> that wants to write because they they're they're really the the payoff for for writing the book. I mean, permission to fly is is what I'm really devoting my life to for the near future because I think it's it I. The, the people in it are, are worth hearing about. Yes, and it, it is. It's very important, and you sharing your story is like, it's something people need to, to know of. 
I am going to ask a bonus question, <laughs> Ms. Delane. What advice, sure. now that you are an author, what advice can you give authors, especially those who aspire to write a memoir? Um, you know, Jewel, mine took me 10 years. And people looking up at 10 years, it's easy to say, oh, my God, I don't want to do that for 10 years. But start. I would say, as crazy as it sounds, just start typing. And you'll be astounded at what will come out because as soon as you start writing about your third grade teacher, <laughs> suddenly all kinds of stuff leaps into your memory. You remember the umbrella she had. You remember how she, you know, slapped some, you know, sandwich that you had because it was dripping on the floor. You know, you remember these little tiny things that make up your whole life and they are what's interesting to people. Um, so just start. That's the biggest advice that I have. And, you know, tell the details. I, I, I say that particularly because when I first wrote the story that was in the New York Times, a friend read my early draft of it and said, Lang, I get it. You know, your wife was crippled in a car accident. That's horrible. But until you tell me why it was horrible, I don't know. So I pulled out all the, the gory facts. You know, I talked about the fact that my wife has a bowel movement in the bed. She she wets the seats on airplanes. There's all, all these, you know, things that, you know, the the glasses her her reading glasses fall off her night table in the morning when she's trying to watch good morning america or something and she can't reach them so she can't watch the darn programming these little tiny nitty gritty examples of of your particular life are what separate your life from the other person's life so skip generalizations tell particular examples of of the things you remember about your life because those are the things that are going to interest people. And literally, sit down, if you want to write a memoir, sit down at your laptop or with a yellow pad or whatever you want to do and just start writing about the day your grandmother uh, spilled the dessert that you were dying to eat or something. Something <laughs> small that means something to you. Just start. Pick some little example of something that happened in your life, and you will be surprised at how it leads to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So I'm repeating myself, but just start. Write a couple of sentences about any little detail in your childhood or your adulthood that means something to you. If that will not keep you guys inspired, I, I don't know what will. Thank you again, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> it's true, Mr. Uh, Lang. Oh, uh, well, you're a treasure, Jill. You're, you're aptly named, buddy. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and and okay. to all the listeners, until next time, so booking cool.